Kyle, do you feel like you're a superstitious person? Oh. Stuff like mm. bad luck or like, you know, being cursed. Like, do you, do you believe in that kind of stuff? I am less superstitious than I used to be. Like, I would think that I would have a bad day if I didn't use equal amount of deodorant on the both sides. <laughs> <laughs> like that's how superstitious <laughs> I used to be. But nowadays I know I'm just gonna have a bad day, so <laughs> screw it. <laughs> well, uh I guess I'm I'm glad. <laughs> well, we what what kind of superstitions are you following, Emily? I mean, I feel like 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 the idea that if you say, Oh, there's no traffic. And like a minute from then, you're going to hit traffic. Like, I'm a firm believer in that kind of stuff in like jinxing it. You know what I mean? Gotcha. So like, like, oh, I don't think it's going to rain today. I'm not going to bring my umbrella. It's going to rain today. Gotcha. So what you do is you wake up and you say, it's going to be a tsunami out there. (laughs) (laughs) No, because I want to go to the beach. (laughs) What I'll literally say is like, oh, man, there's like a 50 percent chance of rain. I guess I'll wear the rain boots and bring my umbrella and do everyone a favor, (laughs) guaranteeing that it doesn't rain. (laughs) Do you say that out loud to yourself just in case? Someone's listening. I, I scream it at the sky, <laughs> at the at the heavens. Do you see it? <laughs> Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. Every week on Butter No Parsnips, your hosts Emily Moyers and Kyle Imperator take you on an adventure through the weird, wacky, wonderful, and sometimes even wicked world of one wayside word. Strange characters, delightful bits, and general joyousness abound. Join them as they test each other's etymological expertise. Hey, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to Butter No Parsnips. I'm Kyle Imperator. And I'm Emily Moyers. Kyle. Emily. I've got a really good word. I'm stoked. Nice. Can I give you the good word? Can I tell you the good word? Can you tell me the bad word first? No, we're going to get to that one later. Oh, (laughs) hey. Yeah, give me the good word, Emily. (laughs) All right, Kyle. Your word today is... Incunable. <gasps> I-N-C-U-N-A-B-L-E. Incunable. Oh. That one didn't sit right with Kyle's stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, I've definitely heard this word before. I and, bet you have. Oh, right now I'm I'm f- racing through my, the filing cabinets in my mind, <laughs> trying to figure out my my brain search history. <laughs> And I'm finding a lot of things that I can't talk about on this podcast, but incunable is not (laughs) one of them. I've got lots of questions. Can I start with the language of origin? It is Latin. Kind of knew that, huh? Yeah, this is, you know, I I normally I try to diverse our portfolio and get some other language of origins in there, but this one was too good to pass up. So it's straight up Latin. It looks like a Latin curse, you know. (laughs) Incunabile. Oh, no, I've been turned into a porcupine. (laughs) Any guesses on part of speech, Kyle? I assume that it is an adjective, that something can be incunable. You are incorrect. (gasps) It is, in fact, a noun. Something is an incunable? An incunable. A thing. I'm thrown for a loop. (laughs) (laughs) That's why I picked the word. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, does the in mean not? Can I ask that question? You can. Can something be accunable? That... <laughs> so I think something can be accunable, but not in English. And also the in does not mean not. The in is something else. Oh, so it means the opposite of out. <laughs> okay, well, I, I am at a loss, and right. I'm going to throw something at the wall, but first I would like my hint, please. Yes, Little you do. Hint. You actually, Kyle, you have the option of two hints today. I have one what? hint that is not super helpful, and then I have a bonus hint that is a little more on the nose, but only if you get it. All right, give me the first hint, and then I'll guess. And then when I'm wrong, you can give me the second hint. <laughs> Your first hint is Newsies. Oh. 
Oh, Emily, I think I know what an incunable is. <gasps> do you? Does it have something to do with typesetting? You're in the realm. I, does it have something? Is it those little pegs that you put in a printing press with the letters? It is not. But again, oh. you are you are in the right realm. Oh, it's got something to do with that. Do you want your bonus uh, hint? Yeah, give me the bonus hint. The bonus hint is STN. Oh no, Emily! <laughs> That's a oh, hint no. for for classic BNP listeners. Classic BNP, all the way back to I believe oh. episode six, Choir. That's what the episode was. Yes, Choir. Oh no, Emily! <laughs> I now I'm so upset that I'm not going to get it. <laughs> That's all right. Make one more guess, and and then okay, I'll yeah. uh, I'll relieve this tension. An incunable. Is that oh, uh, <laughs> is that a font type that like a letter that only exists in one font? Oh, a hey, Pax and <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but the world of printing is the correct world. There, subject and incunable is a book, sheet, or image printed in the earliest stages of printing. Oh. And I should note that this specifically refers to European printing, the early stages of European printing, and often specifically refers to items printed before the year 1501. Why that? We're going to talk about it. It's a weird (laughs) cutoff. (laughs) That is very strange. Uh, It also happens to be the same cutoff of Google Books. So now I'm concerned that there's (laughs) a connection Google Books is (laughs) anti-incunable. Yeah. And I should also note that there's a similar word, incunabulum. That is like the original Latin word, and it means the same thing and is used just as often as incunable. I feel like I've heard that before, and that's where I got the spell from. Sure. And incunabulum, the plural of that is incunabula. Oh! But it all means, like, stuff printed in the late 1400s. I think there's a blog that I've looked at that has a play on that. But tell me more about this incunabula. So, as I said, it is directly from Latin. The in does literally mean in, like inside. And the cunabula is a diminutive form of the Latin word cune, C-U-N-A-E, which means cradle. And in Latin, originally, this word referred to swaddling clothes, i.e. what you wrap a baby in to restrict its movement. So in, an, in a little cradle of cloth. Okay, I'm uh, I'm with you so far. <laughs> Are you seeing the uh, the the tie-in? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, incunabula was also used figuratively to refer to the beginnings of something, something that's in its infancy, in gotcha. early development. Gotcha, gotcha. Yes, and I'm not sure whether it had that meaning in like ancient Latin. But I've seen it used in later European scholars writing in Latin because people were writing in Latin up through way later than anyone needed to be. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the Supreme Court delivers their briefs <laughs> still in Latin, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it is in those later European texts that this word narrowed to be about books. Specifically, there are a couple different people attributed with first using incunabula to refer to the infancy of printing. The common citation is to a German bibliophile named Bernhard von Malinkrot. I'm sorry, I'm finding it really hard to believe that he's not a Disney villain. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe he was, you know, we'll never know. (laughs) He had a book in 1640 called A Historical Dissertation on the Rise and Development of the Art of Printing, which was written in Latin. And he uses the phrase typographice in cunabula, literally the infancy of printing, the infancy of typography. And so that's often credited as, as like the first time that incunabula was used in that way. However, in that book, Malincrot references an earlier Dutch writer, Hadrianus Junius, or Junius, who about 50 years earlier wrote a book called Batavia, which is what Holland was called at the time, which is crazy. That is crazy. Lovely. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Junius uses the phrase artis incunabula, meaning the infancy of the art. But looking at the context of that quote, the art that he's talking about 
in context is printing. So, I mean, I'm no historian, but I feel like it seems like Junius was the first guy to use that. <laughs> Definitely the first guy to use it. And I feel like it's really, I mean, I guess nowadays we can say like, yeah, that whole period was the infancy of printing. But I feel like to still be calling something the infancy 50 years later is like... <laughs> I guess. Well, but all of that is after the fact. So that book was written in like 1588. And then the other one was written in like 1640. Gotcha. So still after what is considered the infancy of printing. Sure. And the 1640 book was published in, I think it was like in celebration of the the, um, 200th anniversary of printing. In reality, it was just the 200th anniversary of printing in Europe. But it was like sort of like people had a fascination with early printed books and it became a very popular collectible item to collect like early printed books. Sure, because I imagine there were very few of them. They were rare. I think today that we know of, there are about 30,000 in Cunabula. Many, of course, have been lost to time. Wow. I'm sorry. I'm just stunned by how small that number is. Yeah. There might be more that we haven't found, but that's, I think, around 30,000 is how many like we know of and, and have. Incredible. Yeah. I, are they are they being graded? Are they, you know... <laughs> So, are they signed up. by the yeah <laughs> by the artist? Yeah. <laughs> and just quickly, Kyle, that alternate form of the word incunable that I said at the top, that came from the French translation of the word incunable, which is spelled the same as incunable, and English basically just kept the spelling and defrenchified it's the pronunciation. <laughs> so that's where we get the more modern word, but both are used, incunable and incunabulum. I don't know which I prefer. Give me to the end. <laughs> of the episode and I'll come up with it. All right. You pick your favorite and then that's the one you'll use in a sentence. <laughs> Sounds perfect. So now, Kyle, let's talk about how we define incunables, how we distinguish what is and is not an incunable. Okay. Which leads me to a conversation about the history of books. And Kyle, hmm. listeners might recall that you gave us a peek into the history of books in our choir episode. They might recall that, or they might choose to put that out of their minds. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Or they might be new listeners who weren't who weren't around at the time, but who, they can who, go back who, who have been born the in the interim. <laughs> born. <laughs> <laughs> they are, one could say, incunable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'll I'll fill our listeners in and maybe remind you, Kyle, because it was a long time ago. That discussion was primarily focused on book binding. Today we are going to focus on printing about how the words got on the page before we put the pages together. I'm excited to get into this. <laughs> so Kyle, what do you know about printing? Like what methods of printing do you know? You know, gotta be honest, I follow, I guess, an Instagram, a social media account of this guy who works at a like a printing press museum. And oh, it's mostly, I guess, like stamps that he's, you know, works with where he like rolls the ink onto a big metal type and then presses it down onto a piece of parchment. But yeah. I think he's done like other types of like typography too. I, I watch those for fun, <laughs> but I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you about it, Kyle. Yeah. So just to start us off, give us a baseline here. Prior to printing, there was, of course, just writing by hand. That was like what? the way books got made. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, really crazy to think yes, about that, but sure. we won't get into that. <laughs> yes, and those handwritten texts were referred to as manuscripts, literally sure. manus, hand, and scribe, to write manuscripts. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, you just unlocked history, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, what the, that's what we're all about here, you know? <laughs> and these handwritten manuscripts are decidedly not incunables. They are... Like where the cutoff is, is like sure. handwritten is not what we're talking about here. So the first form of printing was something called block printing. And that is essentially carving text or images into wood or prior to that stone or bronze or clay and putting ink on that and then pressing it into cloth or paper to get the image or text on yes. the paper. I think that's what I was imagining. Yeah. Block printing was practiced in China, possibly as early as the 200s BCE. 
Wow. Um, definitely by the 200s CE. And not just in China, also throughout East and Southeast Asia, in India, in Egypt, Russia, Ukraine, all by the fourth century or earlier. Wow. Yes. But as I said, the word incunable is used in the context of European printing. Yeah. And Europeans did not start block printing on cloth until around the year 1300 and on paper around 1400. I mean, that's a long time for them to be behind, <laughs> you know, like a thousand years behind, <laughs> like literally not at one point. Did they see this and be like, that's something we should do. <laughs> Truly, <laughs> You know, they call them the dark ages for a reason. <laughs> I'm not sure we're out of them, Emily. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. In any case, uh, these European block books, as they're called, are considered by some historians to be incunables, um, but others are of the opinion that incunables are only books printed by what's called movable type. And movable type as opposed to block printing. In block printing, you'd carve your entire text into like a page-sized wooden block. Right. Movable type is you'd have a bunch of smaller blocks for each individual letter and space and punctuation, which you could arrange and rearrange as needed. Right. That's Gutenberg, right? Heck yeah, Kyle, you got it. Again, though, China was doing it way before. <laughs> You're telling me Gutenberg wasn't Chinese? <laughs> He was not, and neither did he invent <laughs> movable type. The practice was invented in the Northern Song Dynasty in the 11th century, originally using ceramic type, which didn't work great because the ceramic didn't hold liquid ink very well. Yeah. And then they also tried wooden type, which also wasn't good because the wood warped when it got soaked with ink. Yeah. And also you could see the grain of the wood. Eventually, metal type worked way better that became the material that stuck i imagine that it took a while to get to that because it just took a while to be like yeah we're gonna carve tiny letters into tiny yeah. metal blocks <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's something that'll be easy for there. us <laughs> yeah and then movable type was popularized in europe by as you said german inventor johannes gutenberg and the gutenberg press and books printed like this are called typographic books and any european typographic books printed before 1501 are considered incunables Wait, when did you say his typographic? So the Gutenberg Press his... was, I believe, 1439, thereabouts. Wow, so it's only like 60 years. Yes, that's why, I mean, that's why there are so few incunables. Yeah. It's like we're looking that, at a very short span of time. That Honestly, now the fact that there were 30,000 is impressive. <laughs> well, I mean, once they had the press, they were like, oh, geez, we don't got to write these out anymore. <laughs> Yeah. We can make as many as we want. <laughs> what do you think was the first thing they put onto paper, Emily? Well, there's also something called the Gutenberg Bible. So, like, probably that is the real answer. But is that where sorry, let me he, say something funny. <laughs> is, is that where he translated the Bible? But every time that they said peace, they changed it into Johannes Gutenberg or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> no, you're thinking of the Mad Libs Bible. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got one of those. <laughs> Love all the blanks. <laughs> yeah, it's a long Mad Lib, you know? <laughs> it's so long. And honestly makes more sense somehow. <laughs> so, Kai, let's talk about that year 1500 cutoff. Because it's very weird. And in truth, it is just arbitrary. Oh. Yeah. It's basically a way to say that, like, prior to then, Europe was still getting the hang of printing. There was still a very artistic quality to it, I suspect, as a holdover from handwritten manuscripts. Right. And after around the year 1500, printing practices were more established and more standardized. But the year 1500 is just like a convenient random date that's like in the right area, roughly. <laughs> I, I, that's incredible to me that we just stuck with that. <laughs> they were like, yeah, it's a nice round number. Sounds good. I mean, I, it's convenient. I won't, yeah. I won't lie. 
That is literally it. Although apparently texts from the early 1500s up until 1520 or 1540, depending on who you ask, there are still texts that are like stylistically similar to incunables. And those are typically referred to as post incunables. Oh my God. <laughs> Which is just like, it if you're going like to invent a whole movement. other word, just yeah. kick the date down the line a little bit. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Post incunable sounds like, uh, yeah, I had the incunables. <laughs> now I still got a little post incunable yeah, drip. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, Kyle, I want to talk about one more thing, and that is a common feature of incunables and other early texts something called a colophon. C O L O P H O N. I've heard this word before yeah. and I've, I've listed it for myself to use someday with you, but I never so looked funny. up what it meant. So <laughs> well, we're in good territory. Good. But Kyle, <laughs> you might actually know what a colophon is. You've talked about colophons before in the context of a quote, <sighs> carefully managed brand identity. Oh God, of course, of course. <laughs> Do you have a guess? <laughs> Is it like, just like the logo that's printed on the back of an incunable? It is literally, a colophon is an inscription at the end of a book or manuscript left by the publisher, printer, or scribe. God, what was the STN one? It was like, God be with you and also with McDonald's <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that is completely factually accurate, but if anybody wants to double check, they should go listen to choir. <laughs> but yes, the logos and slogans of the STN printing firm would be examples of colophons. Oh, I love that I have a word for it now. <laughs> Continue. Yes. Colophons came in a few different types, conveying different kinds of things. Some colophons were indeed like old timey logos or or slogans, things meant to identify the printer or publisher. And they sometimes also included information like the date and place of publication. Yeah. I okay that uh, that's useful. Yeah, just like little little uh postscript in Latin numerals, I'm sure. <laughs> I love getting like books from the 1960s and the date is written in <laughs> Latin numerals. numerals. I'm like, oh, "Come on, I can't read this." <laughs> so funny. In manuscripts, in handwritten texts, colophons were sometimes notes from the scribe who had physically written out the book. Oh. The colophon was considered the one part of the book where the scribe could speak for themselves rather than just copying over what someone else wrote. Is that why we have like on hardcover books on the jacket, sometimes there's like a from the author <laughs> section? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this would be like from the guy who physically with his hand yeah. wrote the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as such, those colophons typically say things to the effect of finished, thank God, or, <laughs> or my poor hand, or if you're reading this book, pray for me. <laughs> But like in Latin, all nice. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Which f I feel like makes it more dire. <laughs> it's it's so funny. I found one in Latin that literally says like, he who reads this book, pray for the scribe who wrote it. <laughs> but some colophons contained, and get ready, Kyle, book, book, book curses. Oh, what? What? <laughs> Yes, book, book curses book were statements meant to discourage book theft, and they actually date all the way back to the first library, the library of Ashurbanipal, king of Assyria from the 600s BC, which I read about in school. Yeah, in school. <laughs> because I'm getting a library degree. <laughs> Emily, you're so smart. <laughs> all of the texts purportedly, in Ashurbanipal's library, were inscribed with the following curse. Whosoever shall carry off this tablet or shall inscribe his name on it side by side with mine own, may Asher and Belit overthrow him in wrath and anger, and may they destroy his name and posterity in the land. I am stoked to know that that one episode of Courage the Cowardly Dog <laughs> was based on history. <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> there's an episode where there's a phantom that's like, return the slab. So funny. <laughs> or suffer my curse. It's terrifying. Yes, that, but yeah. That is a real thing. 
Wow. Yes. Fiery. Absolutely. Fire and damnation. And book curses in medieval colophons similarly often had a godly angle, as in this lovely example. Quote, mm-hmm. Steal not this book, my honest friend, for fear the gallows should be your end. And when you die, the Lord will say, and where's the book you stole away? It's so quaint. <laughs> it's so, so twee. <laughs> yeah, that you almost think, aw, and then you listen to your brain, <laughs> yeah. which says, You'll go to hell if you yeah. steal this book. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Maybe I want to go to hell. I'm so confused now. <laughs> And where's the book you stole away? Yeah, it's just delightful. I love it. So, Kyle, that is what I have on colophons and incunables and incunabula. I mean, I love that. That's fascinating. I also love that. I feel like the book curse history has continued on with the people who were cursing the fact that they had to write the books. Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of a different sort of book yeah, curse like, there. Yeah, like, I worked my butt off to get this book yeah. <laughs> written, and you're going to just yeah. steal it? <laughs> you don't know what I went through. <laughs> really fascinating stuff. Incunables. Wow, now I feel like I need to own an incunable. How, how, <laughs> what's the cheapest incunable on the market? Can I get them on eBay? Probably not, but They're you know what you can do, Kyle, is you can try to use one of these words in a sentence. Oh. <gasps> I can That's try for free. one of them, <laughs> any of them. <laughs> That's for free. <laughs> okay, let's see. Use it in a sentence, huh? Can I use yeah. all of them in a sentence? I would be overjoyed if you did, wow. but I'm not going to put that overjoyed. pressure on you. <laughs> okay. Well, now I'm feeling the pressure. I'm I'm starting to sweat <laughs> now, Emily. <laughs> no, you got it. You got it. Okay. So the the other day, I reached for some quaint incunable off of my rare (laughs) bookshelf and opened to the back cover where inscribed the the colophon yeah you got colophon relayed this book curse to me hey buddy boy (laughs) stealing ain't no joy if you take our book from here to you we will jeer (laughs) Kyle, I love it. A million out of ten. Oh, thanks. I'm gonna I'm gonna cross stitch that and put it on my wall <laughs> with a little rooster on it. And and we're gonna put that book curse in the back of our eventual book. <laughs> I, nothing would make me happier in this life. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, Kyle, you want to play a game? I more than anything. Kyle, your game mm-hmm. today is called Confusable. As we mentioned at the top of the episode, our word of the day is a noun, but it sounds like it should be an adjective because it has that yes. a bull ending. Oh. But incunable is not alone in this regard. And I am now You're going so smart. to I'm now gonna hint <laughs> at some other nouns ending in A B L E, and you've got to guess what they are. I'm all for it. It's, it's Sign gonna me be up. A, a quick again. I've I've got a, a game that's so quick and so sporkle. You know, I just I, love it's it. perfect <laughs> for when I plug these all into sporkle. It'll make my job so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Kyle. First one: the tortoise and the hare for one. Oh God! It's oh. not necessarily pronounced a bull. It just ends in a b l e. Oh, tortoise and the hare. Fable. Yeah, you got it. Nice. No point in closing the door. The horse has already left it. The barnyard. (laughs) The barnyard door. (laughs) Stable, stable. Stable, you got it. (laughs) A jazz singer might use one. A lozenge. (laughs) (laughs) Kyle never learned how to spell. (laughs) Oh, God. A jazz singer might use one. I'm relying on your knowledge as a music nerd, Kyle. A a table. (laughs) Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess they might, but anyone might. <laughs> okay, so it's a music word. Clefable. Uh, 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 They're not going to use real words. They're just going to use a uh, made up word, which is called a s- scatable. <laughs> a vocable. A vocable. Yeah. yeah. All right, next one. Today's word has four of these. 
syllable. You got it. Oh. And last one, Kyle, it might be buttered or unbuttered. Vegetable. Vegetable, including, for example, a parsnip. A parsnip. Oh, Emily, what a twee game for a twee episode. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> A truly wonderful game, incredible history that you've relayed. I mean, you really well, covered you. the gamut of of history here today. I tried I try to, I know I did a lot of talking in this one, but I tried to give a lot, you know? Yeah, really, really wonderful. Uh, uh, I'm struggling to get to the wrapping up portion here, so I'm just going to start. Hey, everybody. Remember, you can find Butter No Parsnips on social media, on Facebook, and on Instagram at Butter No Parsnips Podcast. And if you like today's episode, consider giving us a five-star rating or review wherever you are able. <laughs> and if you really like today's episode, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash Butter No Parsnips. Donating $5 or more earns you a shout out either on social media or here on the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you. You help us make what we make. And with that, I've been Emily Moyers. And I've been Kyle Imperator. And this has been Butter No Parsnips. Colophon finished. Thank God. <laughs> Colophon. Kyle got through it. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Butter No Parsnips. Butter No Parsnips is produced by Seth Glicksman, Emily Moyers, and Kyle Imperator. The theme music and additional music is by Kyle Imperator. If you liked listening to this episode, subscribe and give us a good rating and or positive review wherever you heard it. If you really liked listening, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash butternoparsnips. There you can get bonus content you can't get anywhere else, like the monthly Patreon-exclusive podcast Buttered Parsnips. Your support means the world to us and encourages us to keep making more. Thanks in advance, and we'll be back next week.